Welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about God's love, pursuit of our hearts, and how to synchronize our hearts with his. As we get started, let's pray. God, we thank you for this day that you have given us, Father. I pray for every person watching, Lord, that you would speak into their lives the way that they need to hear it, Father. That ultimately, by the end of this message, Father, that it would move them into action, Lord, that they would want to seek your heart, Father, and that, Lord, that they would receive the love that you have for them. Father, we thank you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we walk together through Lent, we all took a deep dive into what it truly means to feel Christ's love and sacrifice for us. This journey led us right up to Easter, a time when we celebrate the most important moments of our faith, Jesus' death and resurrection. But during Lent, we prepared our hearts by fasting and giving up something that took our focus away from God to fully grasp and cherish this fundamental principle of what we believe. We meditated on powerful verses like John 3.16, which really sums up the heart of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This scripture and so many others lit the way for us as we journeyed through Lent, constantly reminding us on how huge God's love is, a love so endless, so unconditional, that he would send his own son to save us. We were all invited to really dig into this incredible love, to see where we fall short, and to recommit ourselves to live in a way that honors what Jesus did for us. God's love for us is often compared to the vastness of the ocean. Rick Warren said, God's love is like an ocean. You can see its beginning, but not its end. I love the beach and have lived on the East Coast my whole life. This is the first time I've ever lived away from the beach. The reason why I love it so much is because how powerful, beautiful, and scary it is all at the same time. I mean, I love the smell of the ocean, the blue water, well, except the Gulf of Mexico, which is pretty much black water, and up north where it's brown, but I love the beautiful waves, and I love the beautiful sea life, and the plants that live in the ocean. But it's also scary because of the waves that can quickly overcome you, the riptides that can suck you into the ocean, and that beautiful sea life can be deadly because we're literally invading their home. Y'all need to stay out the sharks, stingrays, and jellyfish's house. Scientists have discovered that the ocean covers approximately 70% of the Earth's surface. It's the largest livable space on our planet, and there's more life there than anywhere else on the Earth. The size of the ocean or the surface area is about 139 million square miles, and its average depth is about 12,080 feet. Even though it is the largest place on planet Earth, the majority of our ocean is largely unknown. Within the vast unknown, it is believed that there are at least 750,000 uh, marine species and possibly as many as 25 million marine species. And get this, 91% of those species have not even been classified yet. So when Rick Warren says, God's love is like an ocean. You, you can see its beginning, but not its end. We can only understand ti a tiny fraction of God's love because our thoughts, experience, and knowledge are just so limited. We can't even fathom the depth and the vastness of his love because we compare it to the love that we feel for each other. But that's like putting our feet in the water at the shore and thinking we know everything there is to know about the ocean. But to even begin to understand his love for us, we need to know his heart. What do I mean when I say know his heart? When we talk about the heart, we're describing what makes a person tick. It's the core of who they are, their true colors, their character, their deepest feelings, and what they're naturally drawn towards. So getting to the heart of someone, that's like unlocking the secret to their innermost self, their soul's DNA. And when it comes to God's heart, we're talking about the very essence, the central part, the foundation of who he is, what he loves, what he wants, his purposes, and his will. But how is the heart of God revealed to us? Well, the word reveals the heart of God. To know the heart of God, we must read his word because this is where God reveals the essence of who he is and his message to the world. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 
We can't know God without knowing his word because they are one in the same. And though we just celebrated what Christ did for us on the cross, how he suffered, died, and came back to life so that we could be free from sin and have eternal life with him, some of us don't truly believe that Christ loved you so much that he specifically died for you. Why is that? Because we don't know who God is, what he loves, what he wants, his purposes, and his will. Why would we believe someone we know nothing about? And because we don't know the heart of God, Some of us don't believe God wants to truly be in relationship with us. We don't truly believe that God can love us unconditionally, which is what the Bible calls agape love. Now, agape love comes from God, who is love in his very core. This kind of love is about giving to others without expecting anything back. John tells us clearly in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. God's actions are driven by his love because he doesn't just love, he is the definition of love. He naturally loves those who might not seem lovable, basically us, because we can definitely be hard to love at times. He stays true to his loving nature, but this isn't because we have earned his love, but because loving is part of who he is. But if, 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 if we don't know the heart of God, We can't fully comprehend the extent and the fullness of his love for us. Since the beginning of the year, I've had the privilege to lead a group of people who want to read God's word from the beginning to the end of the Bible. The best part of this group is the accountability of doing it together. And the next best part of of being in this group are the questions that everyone asks as we read and study together. The core of who God is is being revealed slowly as we read. But the questions that keep coming up as we journey through the Old Testament have to do with God's love for the Israelites or Jewish people and what it means for for Gentiles, meaning non-Jewish people like me. There are many verses where God is specifically talking to Israel and professing his love for them, like in Exodus 19 verses 5 through 6. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And also like in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7, verse 6, for you are people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. And also in Psalm 135, 4, for the Lord has chosen Jacob to be his own, Israel to be his treasured possession. These verses might give the initial impression that God cares and and that God's care and love is exclusively for Israel because they are his treasured possession. So the group started asking great questions like these. If the Israelites are God's chosen people, what does that mean for his love for non-Jewish people? Why did God only care about Israel in the Old Testament? Do you think God is coming only for the Israelites? Were the Gentiles the backup plan for Israel's failure to remain faithful to God? As we read through the Bible and think about these questions, there are two ideas that seem irreconcilable, or in other words, conflicting ideas. The first idea is God loves Israel and has always had a special relationship and plan for them. And the second idea is, were the non-Jews or Gentiles ever part of God's original plan for salvation? And are we as loved as as the Israelites? In other words, if Israel is God's favorite and they are highly loved and favored, how can it be possible that we, the Gentiles, can be highly loved and favored too? And to simplify these questions even further, whether Jew or Gentile, does God really love me as much as he says he does? Today, I wanna reconcile these two ideas and show you that the essence of God's heart and plan has always been that salvation was intended for all people to include the Israelites, the Gentiles, the unlovable, the hateful, and everyone in between, regardless of their ethnic or cultural backgrounds. Ezekiel 18, 23 says, do you think that I like to see wicked people die, says the sovereign Lord? Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. God's love is the central theme throughout the Bible. We will see that we we will see that from the beginning through the Old Testament and on to the New Testament, where God ultimately reveals his plan for salvation, extending his love to all people. 
according to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This truth begins at the beginning. God's promises are for everyone. There are some wonderful examples in the Old Testament and New Testament of God's love for all. I want you to stay with me as we go through this mini timeline of evidence. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. God created man and woman to live in the Garden of Eden in the paradise that he created for them so that they could live a sinless life in direct relationship with God. That was God's original intention, that we would all live in deep personal connection with him. When Adam and Eve sinned, that changed God's original plan for us. But God made a way for us all to still be able to be in relationship with him. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we witness a pivotal moment in biblical history. God calls and blesses Abraham, also known as the father of faith. This call would not only change Abraham's life, but also set the course for the salvation of the entire world. God's promise to Abraham was twofold. First, to make a great nation out, out of his descendants. And second, that through Abraham, all peoples on earth will be blessed. This promise was not just about the formation of a nation that would come to be known as Israel. It was a declaration of God's inclusive love and intention to bring blessings to every corner of the globe. Through Abraham's lineage, God planned to reveal his character and salvation to all nations. That goes beyond geographical, cultural, cultural, and ethnic boundaries. The next person I want to talk about is Jonah. Jonah was a prophet of Israel who was commanded by God to go to Nineveh, a great yet morally corrupt Gentile city. He was sent to warn the people of God's wrath that was coming their way because they were so wicked. Jonah's first response after being sent to Nineveh was to flee from his calling, not because he was scared, but because he knew of God's immense capacity for forgiveness. The people of Nineveh were Israel's adversaries, and Jonah was afraid of God showing mercy to his enemies and that they might repent and be spared from God's wrath. His life-altering encounter with a great fish ultimately led him to give the people of Nineveh the prophetic warning from God. God sent an Israelite to extend his mercy and provide an opportunity for repentance to a city full of Gentiles. Ultimately, Jonah's mission to Nineveh is a foreshadowing of the New Testament's message of salvation for both Jews and Gentiles alike. This story reinforces the theme that God's desire is for the redemption of all people across the earth. God was sure to show the significance of the Gentiles in, in, in Israel's story, proving we are all important in this story. The next person I'd like to talk about is Rahab. Joshua chapter 2 documents the story of Rahab, a Gentile, whose story is another example of God's plan of salvation that transcends ethnic and cultural barriers. Rahab, a prostitute living in Jericho, played a pivotal role in the Israelites' conquest of the city by hiding two Israelite spies sent by Joshua to scout the land. Though she was a Gentile, her actions were led by her profound faith in the God of Israel, who she recognized as the supreme God of heaven and earth. When Jericho was defeated, Rahab and her family live amongst the Israelites serving the God of Israel. It was her faith in God not, that not only saved her family, but she could never have imagined the amazing impact on the generations after her. Rahab, a Gentile and a prostitute, becomes, a, becomes an integral part of God's unfolding salvation story. Next, Ruth, a Moabite widow, chooses to stay with her Israelite mother-in-law, Naomi, and adopt her people and her God as her own. This decision leads her to Bethlehem to live amongst the Israelites where her loyalty and kindness catch the eye of Boaz, a relative of Naomi's late husband. Ruth's integration into Israelite society and her marriage to Boaz not only provide a secure future for her and Naomi, but also place, place Ruth in the lineage of King David, making her the great-grandmother of one of Israel's greatest kings. Now, Matthew uh, chapter 1 gives us a record of this lineage. It begins with Abraham and later names Salmon and Rahab, the, gen the Gentile prostitute, as the parents of Boaz. Boaz and Ruth, the Moabite widow, were the parents of Obed. 
Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. The genealogy continues with the list of names until the very last line that says, Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah, which brings us to Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of God's love for all humanity. In Luke chapter 2, when the angels announce the birth of Jesus, they say to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I will bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. It was clear. It was a clear indication that the Messiah's mission was not confined to Jewish people alone, but was intended for all of humanity. This proclamation set the stage for Jesus's earthly ministry. Now, Jesus's earthly ministry on earth was marked by actions that powerfully supported his teachings. His actions demonstrated a, a love and compassion that knew no boundaries. There was nothing and there is nothing that could stop Jesus from loving people. And when I say people, what I really mean is you. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that, that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. One striking example is found in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, where Jesus heals the servant of a Roman centurion, a Gentile. Jesus is demonstrating his willingness to cross societal barriers to bring healing and proving the point of his message that faith, rather than cultural identity, grants access to God's kingdom. And this brings us back to our friend Abraham. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, that Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures looked forward to, to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ stands as the pinnacle of God's love for the world, a moment where the magnitude of God's mercy and grace was fully unveiled to the world. His death on the cross represents the ultimate sacrifice crossing cultural, ethnic, and religious boundaries to offer forgiveness and salvation to all of humanity. This act of unparalleled love was not confined to Jewish people alone, but was extended to every individual across the ages, showcasing God's desire for a restored relationship with all of creation. As Jesus was dying on the cross, the Bible says in Luke chapter 23, that the whole land became dark for three hours and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. The tearing of the temple veil at the moment of Jesus' death signified the removal of the barrier between God and people that sin had caused, inviting all to come into his presence with confidence and assurance of his unconditional love and acceptance. Through the cross and the torn veil, God's message is clear. His love embraces all, offering redemption and the promise of eternal life to anyone who believes. Therefore, we are all God's favorite. The word clearly outlines God's plan for salvation for the world. His heart is filled with a profound longing for a deep personal connection with his people, characterized by hearts fully aligned with his We've learned that stu studying the word reveals the heart of God. Now the next question is, how do we align our hearts with God's heart? The Holy Spirit empowers us to live lives that reflect God's character. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 20 through 22 through 25, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
There is no law against these things. Those who, be, who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. The fruit of the Spirit are not merely moral virtues, but the expression of God's nature and character within us. These qualities are the evidence of our hearts aligning with God's heart. Alignment is not instantaneous, but a journey of transformation. The Holy Spirit works within us to refine and shape our desires, our thoughts and actions to be more in tune with God's will. This process involves both our willingness to be molded and the Spirit's transformative power. It takes the willingness to start each day with a posture of surrender to God. And what does this mean? This means laying down our plans, our desires, and our will at his feet and asking him to lead us each and every day. It's a recognition that without him, we can do nothing of eternal value for the kingdom of God. It takes obedience to God's commands, meaning to hear God's word and act accordingly. And obedience shouldn't be a burdensome duty, but, but should be a form of worship and a response to his love for us. Obedience springs from a heart that desires to honor God in all the things, right? A heart that is synchronized with his. Living a heart-to-heart -heart life with God today involves a deep personal transformation led by the Holy Spirit. It's about reflecting Jesus in every aspect of our lives, showing the world what it means to live in harmony with God's heart. This journey is marked by daily surrender, obedience, and a desire to make God's love visible to, to those around us through our actions and, and interactions. When my son Joshua was a baby and I was pregnant with his sister, my, my baby girl, Bianca, my greatest fear and worry was that I wasn't going to have enough love for the both of them. How could I love this baby boy, my firstborn son, so much and love another baby just as much? But when she was born and I held her in my arms, God showed me that I could love both of them immensely and that my love was unlimited and unconditional for both equally. When they were kids and they didn't get their way, which was a lot, they would say things like, you love Bianca more or you love Joshua more. But after all the hoop love trying to get their way, because we had a deep loving connection and relationship, they knew my heart. And my heart and my actions proved that I loved them both immensely. Now I wonder how many of us truly know the heart of God intimately and for ourselves. Do you truly believe John 3, 16, where it says, for God so loved you that he gave his one and only son, that if you would believe in him, you shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you don't truly believe that, then this is your time to begin your journey with Jesus. God is in loving pursuit of our hearts, and it's time that we synchronize our hearts with his. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day that you have given us, Father. I pray that every person that heard this message, Father, would hear, Lord, that God loves them so much that from the beginning of time, it was his plan for us to be part of his kingdom, Lord. And I pray that you would put a desire in every person's heart, Father, to seek the heart of God, that we, that we may be intimately in relationship with him, Father, that we would be synchronized with his heart, Lord. Father, that we would know his purposes and that we would know his will, Father, because we are so connected, Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit with God. So God, I pray for each and every person that you may use them, that you may bless them, that you may speak to them, that they may have an experience that they've never had with you in their lives. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this message or you think that it could help someone you know, text the word SHARE to 96995. We've learned that studying the word reveals the heart of God. If you are interested in learning more about the word together, text the word BIBLE to 96995 and we will get that information right to you. Be sure to join us on our online campus at springcreekchurch.org. See you next week.